A lot of people, I think, hide behind computers, hide behind Instagram and social media. Those aren't real relationships. Fail fast, figure it out fast, and either fail, go home, and find something else to do. If you're a part of a company, go above and beyond. A lot of people are like, hey, I'm, I got a nine to five job. That doesn't mean you have to just do nine to five responsibilities. You know, you don't have to just stay in your lane. I'm all about culture, and very few brands have a great culture. If you have a poor culture, it's usually your fault. It's not the employees. Don't think because you put a pinball machine in the lobby or you got a, a snack machine. Oh yeah, I'm building a culture. They get free candy. There's so many things you could do now for extra income. It's endless. If you don't have a side hustle, you're crazy. Yo, welcome back guys to another episode of All For Nothing. I got my man, main, my main man, Bruce, Bruce Wayne of LA. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. I am as well. You've had like seven lives, so I'm excited for you to unpack your seven lives. You're changing lives, and you have a lot of awesome brands, like the water that we're drinking right now. Shout out to, is it Black? Yeah, BLK Water, Black. Yeah. Okay, BLK Water. And yeah, you have quite the history. You are a business owner. You are a former Marine, LAPD. You know everyone in town here in LA. You've seen it from the OJ trials to what it is today. And I'm excited to just have a conversation with you. And uh, just in our minimal conversation, you have a lot of wisdom I can tell already. I'm excited for the audience to hear. Me too. I'm, ex I'm looking forward to it. So what do you have going on now? Like what's, uh, <clears throat> what's on your plate right now in life and business? Um, right now, I'm still, still representing brands. <clears throat> you know, Blackwater, uh, Legendary, obviously, First Form, some different. Uh, so I, I like building brands. And in turn, that means building relationships, which I've really... That was my basis, my my platform for building relationships before I felt built brand. So I'm doing that, doing a lot of podcasts. I created a website. I didn't, but I had someone create a website because ultimately what I want to start doing is coaching people and sharing my Rolodex, my wisdom. And I always say this, like if I could change some people's lives in their starting out and and avoid those landmines or maybe help them kind of all the thing, all the mistakes I made, why not? So I think I'm responsible. I think all of us are responsible when you get to a certain point and you've had a certain level of success to then pass it down, right? Mm. I think that's really, it's a responsibility. Not everyone feels like that way, but I think it is. What's the number one mistake and or obstacle that occurred in your life and how did you overcome it? God, there's been many. I mean, I could tell you a couple. I, I, I filed for bankruptcy when I had my security business and it's really where we could talk about that much more in depth, but I was doing about $4 million a year in the security business and I was still a cop. So that's big money, right? And I was paying myself easily a half a million dollars a year and one of the, and it was a financial thing. It's funny that now Dan Fleischman talks about it. I'm on his, you know, we have a Zoom call every Monday and he talks about be comfortable talking about money. Well, back then I wasn't comfortable talking about money. I didn't know how to ask for money. I didn't know how to really manage money. And my bookkeeper at the time called me and said, hey, your payroll's due Friday, Bruce, and it's $75,000, but you only have, I think, 35 in the bank. I'm like, well, how's that? I didn't know enough about, I just knew I was doing business. I knew I was rolling but then you have the studios like Fox and, and, and Sony and all these brands, they pay, <clears throat> you know, 60, 90, 100 days out. And I was like, holy cow. So I had to basically cash out my pension to pay for that. Fast forward, that was a big learning lesson, right? Who does that? Cashes out their pension to pay for their payroll. Now, fast forward, Dan Fleischman's the world, Pedro's Koolians, all these people I could have called and said, hey, how do I do this? Oh, can I give you a point in my company to borrow a million dollars? There's a lot of things you could do. I just didn't know. So that was a major failure on my part. And it cost me a lot of money. And how did you bounce back from the, <clears throat> the bankruptcy? Because you had to, did you have to file like a business bankruptcy? Yeah, business security? bankruptcy. And that was bad advice. It's interesting. I always tell people this, get, you know, they say you have a medical condition, you get two or three opinions. Or I, now I say that with everything now. If yeah. I had a lawyer say, oh, you should just file for bankruptcy. And I just say, okay, great. What do I do? Instead of talking to three other people, I said, you don't need to file bankruptcy. Restructure, Restructure. pay your debts, whatever. But I took the advice of the first person I talked to and probably because he was cheap, the lawyer didn't cost me a lot of money. So I always say this, there's always get advice from multiple people in anything you're doing, marketing, sales. But so that was, that was a, but I recovered, you know, I, I did that, I regrouped, I renamed the company and I just started fresh and I just, you know, continued to grow. But it took a, it took a, it was a punch, you know, a gut punch. How do you build relationships? Because I think that right now, we're in a unique time more than ever, Bruce, that people have podcast shows. You can connect with basically anyone in the world on the internet. There's mastermind coaching programs. But what I find so interesting with your story is, you know, you, you grew up in 
LA, right? No, De- I grew up in New Jersey. In Jersey, yeah. came to LA decades ago, right? Yeah. So that like in person relationship, those real authentic, is this person out to get me? What do they want from me? Uh, you know, share like yeah. what does someone need to do to build a real authentic relationship? The reason why I'm asking is I've had a lot of bridges burned from people that I love the most. And there were a lot of red flags and I, and I saw that, but I didn't act on it. So now moving forward, it's this weird space that I'm in mentally of like, okay, what does this person want from me? Right. And, and what is this, what is this doing for me, for them? And so I'm curious myself, like, how do you build real authentic I, relationships? It's interesting you use that word authentic. Cause I've always prided myself on having authentic relationships. And one of the things I, I gauge is if I meet someone, I always give more than I receive. I always say this. I make deposits in people's accounts, relationship accounts, and I don't ask for anything. And I've always done that. And it's just come, it's in my DNA. I didn't learn that from my parents. I don't know where I learned it. I just started doing it. And it was even as early as when I was in the Marine Corps, building relationships. But I experienced the same thing. I've been burned. But I say this, I trust everyone until there's a reason not to trust them. I don't go into something that, hey, I heard this guy was in prison or I heard this guy scam money. I still trust you until I have a reason not to trust you. And I've, have I been burned for sure? I've lost a lot of money. I've, in, I've loaned people money, which I've also learned. When you loan someone money, just chalk that up as it's never coming back. So I still enjoy the authentic in-person relationships. If that means me getting on a plane, which I, I've done recently, I've flown across the country just to meet someone. I think now, and even last night, I was at a, a networking event. I didn't get home till one in the morning, but I connected with some really cool people. That wouldn't happen. It wasn't even my space. There were more AI guys and, and women. And I thought, you know what? Well, I'll go as a guest. And it turned out I knew a few people. So I think those relationships are still there. They're there. Mm-hmm. Even though a lot of people, I think, hide behind computers, hide behind Instagram and social media. There's Those aren't real relationships. Yeah, you could DM someone all day long and think you have a relationship. And maybe it cultivates to something. And it's kind of cool. Sometimes people write me and then I end up meeting them in person. But there's nothing better than getting out and shaking people's hands and meeting them whether it's at a mastermind or it's a free elevator night like Dan Fleischman hosts. And I and I will say this too, people are always writing me, hey, how do I, you know, you're at these cool events and maybe they're in another location in the country. I said, well, create your own event. I told a guy recently, he's in Dallas in a, in a real estate business. I said, listen, you're a realtor, open up your office, open up your office after hours and open and invite all the local retailers, all your friends from the gym, all yeah. any walk of life. I said, create your own free opportunity. Create your own toy drive. Don't look through social media and say, look what those guys are doing in LA or New York or Miami. There's so many relationships in your own circles to create. And speaking of LA, you know I'm from Columbus, Ohio, the Midwest, right? People are- uh, The Arnold Classic. The Arnold Classic, baby. You have a lot of uh, bodybuilder clients. You said Arnold was one of your clients, right? Yeah, for years. Yeah, security, yep. So when coming back to the, the relationships- being from Jersey, mm-hmm. you know, growing up a lot of your career and professional time in LA, working with some of the most iconic people in modern time. How how do you make that leap in those relationships? How do you get around those people? So it's interesting. I I I I have I live in different verticals. It's really hard to explain to people that don't don't really completely understand me. So while I'm representing a brand, I'm a total extrovert, right? I'm, I'm, I need to promote it. I need to talk about it. When I'm in the security space, I'm a little more of an introvert in that I've had clients for 20 years and I've had maybe five minutes worth of conversation in 20 years. Mm-hmm. And, and so in the security business, it's much different. I establish relationships, but it's a very, there's a big wall. And one of my clients who's very famous one time <laughs> hired me and called me in his office and said this, and I remember this as saying, I always tell my guys that work for me. This was back when people had Rolodexes on their desk. Remember the big Rolodex? For those that Google Rolodex. <laughs> and he had two Rolodexes. He said, this is my business Rolodex and this is my personal. You're in my business Rolodex. You will never be in my family or friends in Rolodex. He goes, what I'm saying is, Bruce, I like what you do for me, but it's always going to be a business relationship. Please never cross that line or we won't be able to do business together. He goes, because the last guy I had crossed the line and got too friendly with my family. And and so I've always remembered that and I've always maintained that that border. So it's hard. So it's interesting. As much as I'm a relationship king and I believe in relationship capital, those relationships are a little different. They're managed differently. You mm. need the right, really, social cues to understand what that means. And a lot of people don't. I try and train people in that. 
and they just think it's the same, whether I'm selling you this or I'm protecting you and it's not, there's no conversation. So while I have great relationships, it's usually with the staff or the executive assistants or the other mid-level people that manage the life of these companies. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is expectations. Uh, I was actually thinking about that this morning is in my relationships, not to turn this into a therapy session yeah. was like, Oh wait. Uh, although a lot of these quote unquote issues are not my fault, all of it's my responsibility and it was a mismanagement of expectations. So I do like that one of your clients, very successful says, Hey, look, you're here. This is what you help me with. Because last time there wasn't that expectation and things. He got set muddy. the expectation. And, and I say this too, meet those expectations, but exceed them. If he's, if this client says do this, exceed what he wants. In other words, manage that to the utmost. And the same thing, I, I, I've have found that recently. I have not set expectations. Someone did some service for me recently, and I just kind of verbally said, here's what I want. And someone said, you didn't spell out your, your deliverables, really what you want. And I, re- I said, you're right, I didn't. So I mm. got what I asked for. So, what, what are you recognizing as you're coaching and consulting uh, business owners that are maybe just kind of getting started or mm-hmm. scaling up? Uh, what are some patterns or the most common things that you see business owners are running into in terms of obstacles and, and how do they overcome those? I say this to people, friends of mine, I have a lot of people in the food, you know, uh, CPG space, right? Food, beverage, okay. clothing, fail fast, figure it out fast and either fail, go home and find something else to do. What people do, I had a friend of mine recently, he said he started this cookie company and he had all these cookies made and he went to an expo and they weren't selling. And I said, you got to sample them. And he sampled them and people weren't buying them while we were across the way selling the shit out of our product, right? And at the end of it, he kind of bad mouthed the expo and said, oh, this is bullshit. There's a waste of time. And I said, really, what, what the problem is, your product, people tried it and they didn't like it. They didn't come back, circle back and buy it. But you, you didn't fail fast. You should have just made that quest early on. We made the bars by hand. Mm-hmm. We took them, Shannon, who started the company, took them to boot camps for her girlfriends to try. And then Ron took them to work and these tech guys would try them. And they said, these are amazing. Now, if we got feedback that was they were horrible, we probably would have never had Quest, but they we got feedback that we liked, so we kept progressing. But we didn't invest millions. A lot of people you talk to, they'll go out and buy equipment. They'll buy thousands of pieces of shirt, um, of, of apparel, and then pop up a website and no one buys your shirts. Well, did you test it? Did you feel it out? Did you give it to your friends and family? Did you spend maybe five grand getting it out in people's hands and getting mm. what is the fabric right? So I say fail fast. Don't mm. invest a bunch of money. Figure it out. And if it doesn't work, then then move on. But if you're going to dive into it, you got to test it. You got to keep growing. Yeah. Fail early, fail often, fail cheap. Yeah. Right. So in your, you know, process of coming into Quest Nutrition from building a relationship with them at the gym, from my understanding, it's a real authentic relationship. They're giving the product to their family, friends. Do you like it? Cool. It's also very healthy and unlike some other products that are in the space, right? So they have a competitive advantage. And then we can go invest into research and development and inventory and marketing and all that, right? I tell people to this day, I used, Ron would sometimes ask me, I, you know, after once we progressed and I ended up be, be, becoming part of the team, he would say, how much product did you give out this month? And I'll, I'd say, I don't know, $3,000 worth. He said, you're really short. You're, you're really failing, Bruce. You need, to, you need to up that. And, and the point was, everywhere I went, I would give someone a, a bar or I'd give you two bars. And, hey, this is for you. And this is for your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. And people were always like, that's crazy. It costs so much money. How much does it cost? If bars cost us 35 cents, 40 cents to make. And here's the thing. You're going to either become a lifetime customer or you're not going to be interested, right? Mm. But most people would come back to me and say, that was a great experience. Where do I buy it? And I always tell people this, and I don't, they don't get it in a consumable item. Give someone a whole... Don't, you can't give someone a part of a can of a drink. You can't give someone a... You can't chop up a bar and say, here, try it. You go to some of these expos and they have the bars chopped up with the toothpicks in it. I told people, stop doing that. Give them, give them a whole experience. Mm. So my point was, that's how we built Quest. We got it in people's hands. They enjoyed it. And they literally became lifetime customers. What's funny as you're saying that, it's exactly, you know, our mutual friends that, hence why you're on the, on the show. Yeah. Uh, that was like the first thing they said about you was like, you're so giving. But that's exactly how you built the relationships is, don't chop up the bar, put the toothpick in it like you're at Costco for a free sample. It's give, yeah. them, give them the whole bar. And I've noticed that and just in our conversations, interactions, 
I not only not only give, give the whole thing. and this is something I preach, and I, it doesn't it doesn't resonate with everyone. Give with no expectation in return. And now I say this, it's interesting. I've had celebrities, and so it's interesting. Just recently, I was at at the Limitless event in uh, Salt Lake City. It was a big, you know, speakers, motivational speakers, mm -hmm. and Gary Vee was there, and Tim Grohl, all these cool people. And someone was backstage talking to me. He was very influential. And uh, I said, listen, I, I'm going to give you some of this product. I said, but if you ever saw Fight Club, the first rule of Fight Club is we don't talk about it. It's an old movie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's like, ah, that's kind of funny. I go, no, I seriously, that's how, I don't want you to, if I, I'm giving you this, but don't talk about it. Two hours later, he does an Instagram post saying, I'm with the coolest dude in the world. And he tagged me, he tagged the company. And I didn't ask him to, but he did it. And that happened all the time at Quest. I could name Ronda Rousey, Bruce Willis, all these people would get the product and I'd say, I just, I'm just, please, I'm not asking you for anything. Don't talk about it. Don't post about it. And I think it subconsciously makes people feel like, shit, I really, now I have to do it. I think it's nothing worse than a brand and I get solicitations all the time. Hey, I want to send you some of our hoodies and uh, if you can do an IG post, I'm not really interested. If I like your product, I'm going to talk about it all day long. Like mm. I wear this hat, you know, Fuel Hunt, right? They're cool dudes. They're a couple dudes out of Philadelphia. I wear it all the time. I like talking about them because they're just nice people. Mm. And I believe in what they do. So that's where you got to find people that are going to truly believe in what you do and support it. And there's no catch. There's no, I'll do this for that. Who would you pick as like the top five people that uh, you could have dinner with? You've met oh, geez. some of the most iconic people. But if you could have dinner with these five people, dead or alive, who would they be? Uh, probably Jesus Christ, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. Did we go on the moon? We did. Don't go. Let's not go there. <laughs> Jesus. Um, I think Elon Musk mm. and Jeff Bezos. Jeff's, an, I mean, it intrigues me that here's this guy who worked in Goldman Sachs making really good money. He said, I'm going to move. I'm going to go buy, sell books. And people thought he was an idiot. So, I mean, I think everyone has a, I just, I'm, I'm intrigued by history and stories and I just came up with those names while you're, you know, I don't, I, I don't per se have a running list. It changes. I want to, I want to have you shed some light on your uh, background as a former U.S. Marine. Again, thanks for your yeah, service. Thank you. Uh, LAPD. What's, uh, what's going on in the world right now? Is there anything that makes you nervous about? The United States, anything that makes you nervous about cities like San Francisco, LA, New York City, World War III, like what what's going on? That's a lot of that's a lot of question. Um <laughs> so I've always tried to avoid politics and religion in conversation, right? Even nutrition, because it's funny, that can become like a battle. I like um, to focus on those two. Yeah, yeah. And, and here's the thing. <laughs> um I think, you know, I got I grew up in the Marine Corps. I mean, I I, I there's been tragedy. I, I from I went to Beirut when I was a young Marine, so I'm mm -hmm. always, there's always been conflict ever since I've been an adult, right? Mm -hmm. I think the conflict we're dealing with now is literally, I think people should really pay attention. It doesn't matter who the president is. It kind of does, but um, there's a lot of things going on in the world. And We, we said, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you. We, remember, we, I feel like there was a time in, in life where, I don't know, between like Bush and Obama, it was like that weird time of, it doesn't really matter who the president is. And then like Trump came in, like, uh, maybe. Yeah, and yeah. Biden came in, maybe. Yeah. Like I was in the Marine Corps. Ronald Reagan was a president. He was, I just, I, I remember him like a no nonsense guy. Like he, he wasn't afraid of other people. But mm -hmm. um, I think what's going on now, we're on, we're on the brink of some serious things. And I, I just hope, I hope we get out the other side because it could be devastating for the entire world, you know? So <clears throat> from an investment business standpoint, uh, I'm concerned with like consumer debt, interest rates, inflation, but yeah. then we have this unique time, what I refer to as the new digital economy, doing this right here, a podcast yeah. show, social media, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, um, artificial intelligence, but yet we're having like this biblical war unfolding. We're having this very simple war with like food and water and shelter so we have like this forward thinking type stuff, right? The new digital economy, but yet we're still struggling with the things that we've been struggling with since biblical times. So yeah, th that's what I keep my eye on coming back to like consumer debt, interest rates, people's credit score dropping. Uh, I'm curious on your take on just like the economy 
in general, like the next year or two opportunities, things that you have your eye on? Listen, I think, you know, real estate's a prime example, right? And friends, I, I've invested in real estate before and I, I've lost and gained, but that's a prime example. It's never a bad time. Uh, just like Warren Buffett will say, it's never a bad time to invest. You know, he'll show you the scales from 1970 on up that it's always progressively grown. I don't think you, unless unless we see doomsday coming, you know, I think you always have to look at it optimistically to invest, invest wisely, invest smart. And uh, the world's going to continue to grow and continue to, you know, turn. I don't, I don't necessarily see, I think, you know, they keep saying we're in a recession. We've been in a recession for a year or so, right? You know what they say? I yeah. Uh, recessions back to back quarters of a uh, the gross GDP, yeah. you know, having a decline, and then they change like the definition around it. So yeah, I pay enough to be dangerous. I I mean, listen, I see. I mean, I don't really pay attention to prices, uh, but but I notice gas has gone up. My Jeep costs a hell of a lot more to fill up. But I think I think you have to remain optimistic in this world. If we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to eat and consume items, and mm-hmm. and the world's going to continue to to produce. So. What's uh like? What's one thing that you want people to know about you, and or maybe one thing that people don't know about you? One thing that I I, I want to be known. Listen, we're we all have a legacy, right? I mean, listen, when you're gone, you're gone. You, they, what do they say? They remember you for a few months, and next thing you know, you're. My kids reminded me a while ago. It's crazy. I have a lot of memorabilia packed up in these cases, like cool stuff, like stuff. I got a. I have a pair of boxing gloves from Muhammad Ali that he signed. I got him at his fiftieth birthday party, right? Like That's I cool. have I have a lot of cool stuff. And my kids said, dad, that's cool to you. But you know, when you're gone, we're throwing that shit out. And I was really like, what? And I realized something. It, it, we're only, we're just here for this amount of time. We're here for such a nanosecond. And I think I want to be known as someone that made some difference, some change. And, you know, my dad was known that he was our, he was our scout leader and he did cool things in the community. He built these community centers and he, and he, there's a trail named after him for a hiking trail. Back in Jersey? Back in Jersey. There's a plaque. And and I remember the things he he and I started a recycling program for my Boy Scout project. And I remember he did some cool things. It was on a small scale, obviously. No one knew him. He was just a local guy in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. But I think I want to be known as like, I, I if I'm changing people's lives, I want to be remembered for that. Even if I change some young entrepreneurs' lives or, or change people's minds in the fitness industry or help people grow mm-hmm. or help people just create a new business. You know, I, I like to be known for something more than just, listen, money facilitates things in life right and mm-hmm. if you can't do better things with it or help people with it or help people it doesn't always mean money it could just be your knowledge your energy your time i think we owe it to other people to help people so that's kind of my that's my take i want to be known as a a giver instead of a taker yeah money money magnifies right like yeah. usually uh if you are doing certain things going to certain places you're likely just going to do that more it yeah just puts exactly a magnifying glass on uh, the things that you're already doing and or the person that you are. Like I like doing, I have, you know, involved with a couple of charities. One, you know, Trina's kids, um, uh, the midnight mission downtown toys for mm-hmm. tots through the Marine Corps. I like doing that. I've bought, but I've always done that. And I just feel like it's, it's just a good way to give back. And, and do you have your own charity? No. You, okay. You said like on the chair of some of them or yeah, just... I, no, just advisor. Okay. You know, I'm on the board of some companies, but no, I just, as far as like Trina's kids is a local charity does kids, you know, kids stuff for back to school. I like working with Dan. He has his toy drive. Yeah. Um, Midnight Mission has just been something I've always spent my major holidays going down serving breakfast in the morning. How'd you meet Dan? I've uh, known of Dan. We've met like briefly, uh, but definitely want to build a deeper relationship uh, with him over time. But I yeah, met, shout I out to I think I Dan. met him at one of his elevator nights, maybe. I don't remember. He hosts okay. those for free. I think he's put on like now 55 of them. Yeah, that guy's. But that's always- a prime. So Dan's a prime example. He always talks about create your own elevator night in your own city. It doesn't, you don't have to come to, you know, here to do it. Yeah. If you want to invest in real estate and you have no idea how to get started, yeah. where to invest, what to do, I say that all the time, just create a podcast show and interview people that are already in real estate and ask questions. Yeah. Where we were just you? talking to Carson. He, he, he helped Dan with a couple of books. One of them is uh, how to, how to build a business for under a thousand dollars or how to build a brand. So you're wanting to write a book, right? Books. Books. Yeah, the more I'm around, so you've, everyone knows what an int- uh, entrepreneur is. I was an entrepreneur at Quest Nutrition. I was very fortunate when I met them, and we didn't really talk much about it, but I, I brought them value and had no expectation in return. And what I quickly figured out was each each founder, each owner had their own responsibility. One was in charge of R&D, one was in charge of manufacturing and finance, and one was in charge of sales and marketing. But they didn't know what they didn't know. 
So we were mm -hmm. a brand new company. So I kind of started helping them. And they said, okay, you want to do events? Great, do events. You want to build up? And I started building out the ambassador program. So I kind of became an entrepreneur inside of a company. I didn't really add, I mean, I had a budget, but other than that, I just did what I wanted. And I'm not saying I ran amok, but I literally had the freedom. But I paid my dues. I always tell people this about commit to, if you're a part of a company, go above and beyond. A lot of people are like, hey, I'm, I got a nine to five job. That doesn't mean you have to just do nine to five responsibilities. You know, you don't have to just stay in your lane. If I did that, I probably would have never had the equity I had. I went above and beyond. And, and, and I tell people, I think I traveled about 40 weekends a year out of, out of 52 weekends. I was on the road 40 weekends a year. I would leave the office on a Thursday night, come back Sunday night and be back at the office Monday and do it again and again and again. And anything the company needed, I just don't, jumped in and did it. I put mm. stuff on my own credit card. I paid for my own travel. These are early on. And, uh, you know, I, I encourage people to do that when you're on. It doesn't matter where you work, a real estate company. It doesn't really matter. Just do more and you'll be recognized. Yeah. And for business owners listening as well, like <clears throat> people go, well, my team, they don't care. My employees don't care. Obviously, no one should care as much as you in terms of how much you care about your own business. But if you find the right people, like they found you, right? You guys just, you know, connected how you did. You cared. If you're an entrepreneur and you start to see people caring, are they trying to sabotage the business? Are they trying to do something wrong? Mm -hmm. Whatever that may be, that's where I've personally dropped the ball in the past. Like, oh, this person cares about this business. Yeah. Let's give them some equity. Let's give them some vested interest and vested e equity that says, oh, yeah, I need to bring them on board. Because I think there's a lot of friction and ego uh, that says, well, I'm not going to bring in a partner in. This there is my business versus, no, you want people to care as much as you and you can structure something accordingly that says. You want to, you, you listen, they're, they, I don't even know what they're, it's funny, that became my why. It's mm -hmm. funny, it was, I was so passionate about what we were doing. We were changing people's lives. It became my why. I sometimes, I call it pride in ownership. I had pride in ownership. And really, for the duration of our time there, most people thought I was the founder. Because mm. when I was out and about, I was the only guy out there. I was at the CrossFit Games. I was at the Arnold, you know. And, and what happened was, and I call it pride and ownership. I had such pride in what we did. I felt like I owned the company. And even around them, when I was with the founders and we were in public, people would come up to me and we'd start a conversation and say, what are these, who's this guy? And, he, and they would usually say, oh, we work for Bruce because they didn't even want to take the thunder away because they realized, and I never claimed I was the owner and I would acknowledge him as the owner, but they realized I had such pride in what I did. It was irrelevant who they were. Does that mm. make sense? Oh. That's such a rare quality. Like our founder who then rolled over and started Legendary Foods, his is not about the ego. His is about building brands and having success. And he he, you want people like that. You want people yeah. that a CEO that's confident enough to bring in people to run at his level and not be worried about anything, you know? Yeah. And a lot of times when people say, I find this, people think they have a great culture and it's interesting. I'm all about culture and very few brands have a great culture. And I always tell when I consult like executives or CEOs, if you have a poor culture, it's usually your fault. It's not the employees. Mm -hmm. Don't think because you put a pinball machine in the lobby or you got a, a snack machine. Oh yeah, I'm building a culture. They get free ping pong, ping pong. Yeah, table. whatever. Foosball. I love talking about culture because you could feel it when you walk in a building. And I've only been in a few places, Reebok, uh, Bedros Koulian's headquarters, you know, uh, he owns uh, Fit Body Bootcamp, but he has oh, yeah. headquarters in Chino Hills, uh, First Form. Mm -hmm. When you walk in those headquarters, you feel it, how people talk to you, how they treat you, everything about it. And when I try and describe it to people, they, a, lot of, a lot of leadership doesn't get it. And I said, well, first of all, it'd be a closed door policy. You have to go through an assistant to get to you, which I get when you get to a certain level, you need to have certain level screening. But there's a lot of things that I think it's called um, intellectual arrogance. Like they become like, I don't like they think I'm running the company. I don't need to talk to the janitor. Well, you damn well, you need to talk to the janitor because he's just as he or she is just as important as your COO. Yeah. And the janitor will see some stuff that you'll never see. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They, they got access to everything. Right. So I, I like that because, uh, I've learned in my journey that culture and communication is by far most important. Uh, and it's literally everything we've talked about so far, building relationships, uh, being able to set expectations and all these different things come back to culture and, and communication. 
So you were the chief communications officer, right? At Correct. Quest Nutrition. Yeah. You guys ended up exiting for a billion dollars, I believe, uh, in less than a decade. A billion dollars cash, which is a unicorn in business. If you if you look this up, and Alex Ramosi just said something recently on an interview. I didn't know this. There's less than a billion. There's there's less than fifteen hundred billion dollar companies that ever ever existed in the world. There's I don't even know. I don't think you could find the number for two companies that are, so we're working on the second company, Legendary Foods, mm. which will be evaluated at a billion dollars in a couple of years. I don't know of any companies that, on anyone that's built two billion dollar companies. I mean, yeah, Elon Musk is, and, but there's, I can't think of anyone else. I mean, there's only a handful of people. You? Yeah, yeah. Come on now. I mean, part of a team. I mean, me, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm not an I person, but to be part of a success, I mean, it obviously takes a whole team, but um, yeah, so that's. What are you guys doing at uh, Legendary Foods? I think we're taking everything we learned at Quest and making it better. So all the mistakes we made, and believe me, we made mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. There's healthier versions. I don't know if you tried or not, but you know, if you grew up in the States, everyone's had a Kellogg's Pop-Tart, right? Picture a Pop-Tart, but with 20 grams of protein. Look at me, Bruce. And Come we on. sweet rolls, and we have chips coming out. We have all these cool things. We used to say this at Quest, and it's, and it's something that'll be the same thing true at Legendary. Imagine going to a Super Bowl party, and you see that table with the, with the nachos and Doritos and Oreo cookies. They'll be, they will be, just like there was a quest table. There'll be a legendary table where you can have healthier snacks and still feel like you know good about cheating. Yeah, that's what I remember about Quest was one, uh, being from the Midwest. I'm like, who's gonna pay five dollars or whatever the the number was for like one of the protein? You must bars. bought it at the airport for. Five. Yeah, <laughs> they, they are yeah. five bucks at the airport. But I was like, what in the world? Who's yeah. gonna buy this? And then I was like, oh, they were like one of the first innovators with. You know, you having like that chocolate chip cookie without the guilt. Right? That was our number one seller. So mm -hmm. that's twenty or uh, twenty five bucks a box. What is that, sir? Twenty five bucks a box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, um, who in the world's going to buy this? It, it's it. It, you know, it was a healthy alternative, right? Yep. I mean, we all need protein, and for sure, that's another conversation. No one gets enough protein, and it was just a good way to go. Whether it's on the go, whether it's uh, you know going to the gym after workout, but it's just an alternative. You know, I uh, listen, we used to say this even when you called customer service, Whole Foods the best route, right? But it's an alternative. Whether you have a protein shake or a bar or you're traveling, it's just an alternative. Absolutely. It's not it's another option. It's not a not the go to. Yeah, I don't think anything personally, I'm a steak guy, right? Yeah, eat me a, too. Eat a ribeye steak, a lot of problems will be solved in your life, yeah, right? That's what, so, uh, yeah, I told one of my vegan friends recently, said, let's go have a ribeye and talk about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know why you're mad. You're vegan. Yeah. That's why you're mad. Let's go have a steak and yeah. figure this out. You're hungry. You need a you need a steak. Share uh like what's one of your core memories? I know you have a lot of them. You have a lot of life experience. You've been around the coolest people. Um core you know what I'll, I'll be honest with you, I just talked about this the other day. I think my father's work ethic and how he treated people really resonated with me. I think it obviously trickled down because he would have been called a workaholic then. Now, or he was called a workaholic then. Now he'd be called an entrepreneur. Mm. And by the way, he balanced his time because he, he, he I mean, he was a great dad. He, he was our little, he, he wasn't a great sports coach, but he got involved with our sports because his kids played, right? So he was the assistant little league coach, helped with Pop Warner football, built the, built the snack shop where we, you know, wanted to sell goods. So I think my best memory is an upbringing by a guy like that, who was our scout leader, who I learned all these things. I learned how to make uh, our own beef jerky we, you know, outside. And we used to hike every summer 50, 50 miles at a clip on the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah. So I, I mean, we were just a middle-class family. We didn't have a lot of money. We, he worked hard to, to raise our family with five of us. Um, so I think that was my, that was my baseline, mm. his work ethic and how he treated people. But also being like involved, right? Being, and involved. Yeah. Yeah. Just being, just, just being there. Right. Shout out to my mom. Uh, you know, she was always, always there and, or like try yeah. to do everything she could to be there versus people I've least recognized. It's easy to judge. I don't have any kids yet, Bruce. So yeah. Of course I can be like, man, those people don't know how to raise kids. <laughs> For sure. I don't have them, but. But to be just, present is important to be present. Yeah. Yeah. And you being know. present to like actually be there where now phones and you could just be not watching your kids practice or watching the game. You're yeah. responding to emails on your phone. Uh, do you have kids? I do. Yeah, they're adults. Yeah. Okay. What do they do? Uh, my my daughter is a nurse, and my son's an entrepreneur he, involved with construction. Oh, cool. Yeah, he does several things. Here Maintain, in LA. Yeah, yeah. Main, he's a 
captain for a fleet of boats too. Yeah. How do you uh, manage all of this? You were at dinner last night till two a.m. Yeah, I like you know what I I, I um, Jess uh, Isler Jesse Isler love him. He, he believe it or not he's an old client. When he had Marquee Jet, I was handling security and the transportation. He didn't know me, which was sold to. Well, NetJets, which is in Columbus. For $5 billion or $4 billion. And NetJets but was been a client of mine for, for 15 years. Mm. I used to go, I, I won't get too, you, you asked me a question. What was the question about how I stay about staying yeah. managed? So Jess Isler says, you know, we only have so many, so much time on the earth and so many experiences we're going to have. And he actually broke it down one time in a post. And I was like, God, he, you only have like, he, he said, I'll probably only see my parents maybe. It's a, the parents' story. Yeah, like I'm going to see my parents like another 20 times. You know, sometimes you see your parents once, once a year maybe or Thanksgiving or Christmas. If your parents are 60 years old and like, oh, they'll probably live till 80, the average age. Yeah. Oh, I'll see it 20 more years. No, no, no. You're going to see them twice a year. Yeah. You're only going to see them 40 times. Exactly. And he talked about experiences because he takes his kids hiking and they do all these cool things. He's got an event going on this weekend, actually. And, it, and I realized that. So when people say, I have nothing but time, you have nothing, you don't have time. Mm. So I, I enjoy managing. I, yeah, I keep a calendar and okay, I'm going to, I know I'm going to go here. I'm going to work out with this person, I'm gonna do this podcast. I'm going to go to this event tonight. And I feel fulfilled because, mm. and don't get me wrong, I have plenty of downtime, but I feel like we only have a limited time on this earth. And why not either experience things, help people grow, whatever it means. But I don't know, sitting at home is just not always, you know, I, I've done it many times and many nights, but it's just not my first. So I think those experiences are important. But um, it's funny, we talked about NetJets. They were a client for a long time. And we used to go every year, they had the owners would have a retreat at the Wynn Hotel, a, a poker tournament for three days. And the craziest thing, like Warren Buffett would come and play poker with us and Bill Gates was there and it was very cool. But that was another, like those are experiences. I, I who Who is a middle-class kid from New Jersey having these experiences, right? So I chalk those up that like, those are memories that I could never, mm -hmm. how's that going to happen? You know? Yeah. I love, I love Jesse. I was, uh, I tore my Achilles earlier this year. So recovering from that, but he was like one of those first people I found like online in my personal and business development where, uh, love running. I started running ultra marathons and everyone around me. Oh, you like, did? Yeah. Oh, wow. You're crazy. That's legit. Then I came across, uh, living with a seal and I read that book and, I went and ran a hundred mile race, ran 24 hours around uh, Ohio State. Oh my God. If you know Ohio State, yeah. they, they have like the oval. It's one mile, yeah, yeah. just 24 hours straight, baby. A little just, David Goggins in you, huh? Well, that's the book is Living With I the know. Seal was the Goggins, right? I remember. So, I heard all about it. Yeah. And I'm like, and then I ran like the four by four forty eight, run four miles every four hours for 48 hours. And uh, so I, I say all that because I think Jesse is like one of the most impressive people in terms of, well, one, his wife. I mean, yeah. shoot, she has a Banks. billion dollar, yeah, billion dollar company. Yeah, but just his whole, just like I don't know, energy and mindset on things, and just you could just tell operates in a very positive frequency. Down to earth, very humble. I mean, for for the wealth they have, I mean, I've seen him where he flies Delta with his kids. Yeah, you know, there's he does he does some good stuff in his rocking life. the t shirts and yeah, you know, the, he was just at an event. I was just in Aspire uh, in San Diego last weekend. He he was speaking. Who are who are a couple of people that's like really inspired you? I just mentioned Jesse for me. Uh, but like who are maybe three, five people that, that, I, come that I personally know, or I mean, it, yeah, just whatever. I mean, uh, you mentioned your father, right? Yeah, like obviously. Yeah. He, he's probably been the most inspiring me. He's been, you know, he, he died of colon cancer years ago, but he inspired me because he was a vet. He was a Vietnam vet and he, he had, you know, we grew up, it's interesting when you grew up in that environment, you don't know, like he was a burn victim. He got an explosion and he had, you know, the scars on his arms mm. and legs and, he was always in pain, but he never told us, and, and I didn't know. But it, so I, you know, I didn't know till he actually died what he had really gone through. When my mom shared those stories, but so he's inspired me greatly. Mm -hmm. But people, I I like people I've been around, like Bedros Koulian, who you know started Fit Body Bootcamp. He mm -hmm. came here from Armenia. Um, he inspires me because he works hard. He 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 he's relentless. You know, mm -hmm. he's the one that says uh, average is the enemy, and that's one of my coin phrases. And he's always on the go. Um, you know, Dan Fleischman's a, a really inspiring guy. Works hard. He started young. And he just goes from business to business. And he gives back, which is really cool. I like people that give back. So mm. Pedro's gives back. He does a lot of work for the Shriners Hospital. He gets a lot of money to speak. And he donates it to the church. I mean, to the, to the Shriners Hospital. Dan has these charities, these toy drives. He's working on the largest toy drive in America. Yep. He does a lot of things for free. 
So I like that people not only do well in business, but that you see the side that they give back. Mm. That's what inspires me more than anything. And, and speaking like giving back and money, you know, money, how do we make money? How do we keep it? How do we invest it? Uh, what would you say are, you know, one thing in each of those categories, like, yo, Tyler, an audience listening, this is like the number one thing you can do to make money. Number one thing to keep it. Number one thing to invest. None of this is financial tax, legal advice. Yeah, 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 disclaimer. of course. Because I'm but, not that guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious. I'll your- say this, in the world we live in, if you don't have a side hustle, you're crazy. Like, I know a lot of people, oh, I, I, you know, I work in an office nine to five and I can't do anything else. Of course you can. There's so many things now. I didn't know this. I mean, I know this now, but like items you could sell on Amazon, you don't, you could even just be a sell through. You don't even have to own anything. Just create your own platform and you could sell widgets, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, if you don't have a side hustle, making extra money, that's just not excusable these days. Um, It doesn't matter what is, whether you're, you want to work as a trainer part-time because you're fit. doesn't mean just because you work in an office. So that's one thing. And then take that money and invest it. You know, a lot of people, I think, live check to check. They think there's always going to be money coming in. And I don't, I don't look like that. It's, have, a, have whatever they say, two months save, three months save, just mm-hmm. invest it. Buy a rental property. There's so many things you could do now for extra income. It's endless. Yeah. Yeah, I think it gives people some analysis paralysis, right? It's yeah. like, well, step four and five. And it's like, no, just go... Yeah, go do something either a skill set and or go flip something right go get something that's free on facebook marketplace like a free couch yeah. and sell it for 100 bucks so my daughter's a master i didn't even know that this yeah uh, facebook marketplace mm-hmm. she's always getting stuff i'm like where do you, where'd you yeah. find this so i'll give you an example so I, I saw an article on on facebook the other day about a kid who started he bought a vending machine and now mm-hmm. he's making a half a million dollars a year he has a handful of vending machines and my daughter said i always wanted to do that i said well you do the homework and i'll invest with you yeah. I'll find I'll, I, I'll figure out where to put them. But if there's a business to be had, let's just do it. Mm-hmm. And I like that she has the drive to, to think about that. But that, those opportunities are out there. And a lot of them are free. You don't have to come up with a lot of money to get something going. Yeah, there's either someone's going to help you finance it or there's just people that say, hey, just take this over. I just heard this recently. I was at a seminar and the baby boomers, which are you know older now, <laughs> there's over 3 million businesses right now that are, I want to use the word up for grabs. They're either going to close them because they come of age where they're like, okay, they own a locksmith business and they don't have anyone to pass it on to. Mm -hmm. Sadly, they're just going to close or they're going to sell it, but more of them are just going to close because they don't know there's an option to sell or to pass it on or the kids don't want it. So I tell people this right now, there's 3 million businesses that are out there right now, whether it's a local sub shop or a a printing company, look for those opportunities. You could probably get them for free and even do something with the owner where, listen, I'll pay you X amount a month for the next 10 years if I let me just take it over. So when I say there's opportunities, they're out there. It's just a matter of finding it. Yeah, you had mentioned Alex Hormozzi. That's, that's <clears throat> you know, kind of been his play is acquisitions.com uh, in terms of buying businesses, right? Yeah. And the largest transfer in U.S. history in terms of wealth, businesses, assets are going to either get passed on to the next generation. Uh, but that's likely not going to happen. Like you mentioned with, uh, the business example that you gave. Uh, but one thing that you mentioned is your daughter mentioning the vending machine. You're like, I'll just figure it out. That's it right there. You're like, I know I'm creative and I know I'll find a solution. In other words, I can buy that person's business that I know they need to sell and, or it's just going to shut down because their family doesn't want it or they just need to sell it's I'll figure it out. You can get creative. You can do seller financing. You can cut yourself into equity and say, I'll pay you over five years. There's always a solution, right? Friend of mine at the gym, he's a little older. He, he just retired and he, he has a printing company and he mm-hmm. sold it to his employees. He didn't sell it to them. He gave it to them and they're going to give him X amount of dollars a month and make it a win-win. But he said, I wanted them. They've been with me for 20 years. There's opportunities out there. There's someone right now, that a 70-year-old guy that has a vending company that wants to just get out of the business. He's probably got 50 machines around Southern California. You just have to find them. ATMs. like ATMs. That's an, yeah. But so what I'm saying is I think people want it given to them and just do a little homework and you'd be surprised what you could do. Totally agree. What's a, what's a question that the audience should should ask themselves as we wrap this up? Um, what are you doing to to better yourself, your family, and your friends? What are you, what are you doing? Are you bringing value to everyone in your circle? 
I say this, I think we, I, like I said, we owe it. I owe it to my friends and my family to bring value to them with no expectations. And it, not everything is transactional. I have friends of mine, it seems like I bring them to events and everything's right away. It's, oh, hey, I'm so-and-so, I, I sell this or I do that. It's okay just to meet people and have no, you don't have to always sell something, you know? That's, it's so crazy. We were just talking about it last night when I flew, uh, flew in, excuse me, when I arrived in town and flew in. And even this morning, my caffeine's not, not kicking yeah, yeah. in all the way, <laughs> but that's, that's just the expectations. It's, it's so simple, but most things, if not everything is, we just like to complicate it. It's like, oh no, you can just, you can just have a friend. You can just go watch the Thursday night football game tonight and have dinner with somebody that is also successful and there's no transaction going on. We're just chilling, having a good time. It's okay not to be transactional. Things come. I've known people for years and all of a sudden they reconnect and say, hey, I didn't, I didn't know you did this. Or It's not always transactional. Just have good relationships. And sometimes things just come out of, out of good relationships. But uh, Totally agree. And as we wrap this up here, uh, you are offering coaching. You're doing public speaking. Yeah. You get on podcast shows. Who do you not want to help? I know you you want to <laughs> save the world, but you know, not Mother who, Teresa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who who's like, don't click the link below, right? Like I want to avoid those people for you and I want to get the right I, people. I don't think, you know, listen, I really want to help entrepreneurs that really truly are have a have a plan. If they don't have a plan, that's okay not to have a perfect plan, but a, you're already moving along and I want to help you. It's I, I'm good at the early stages of a company, helping mm -hmm. them get moving. Um, I don't, don't, I mean, don't write me and say, Hey, I just want to start a business. And where do I begin? You have to have some level of like competency as far as what you want to do, right? Whether it's financial, but I, I'm willing to talk to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I think, uh, I think that's, that's part of my, that's part of my zone. I think I like helping people and talk to people. I yeah. love it. I love it. Last question. Yeah. I think I've said this like seven times now. Uh, the show is all for nothing. Uh -huh. And the reason why I named that is. I want to ensure that we're not doing this all for nothing because I believe most people live their entire life with nothing to show for it. Yeah. And, or they do build up all these things, but within the second generation, it usually goes back to poverty. So what are you doing to ensure that you're not doing this all for nothing? That's a great question. I don't know if I could completely answer that. I mean, I think I've established some level of, uh, of investment that I could pass on. Mm-hmm. You know, even if it's the equity in my house or some of the assets I own, but I think uh, I'm definitely not doing enough, and I have mm -hmm. more to do. That's why I want to continue mm -hmm. to build brands, and I've structured a couple of deals where I have equity in some of those brands. But at the end of the day, I I'm I'm not a hoarder. I don't want to just I don't want to you know just die with a bunch of money. I want to share it with people. I, I I love when I see wealthy people doing good things for people. You know, mm -hmm. and you might as well do it while you're still here too, right? To actually see it. Make sure your kids or your family benefit from it while you're still here. So Absolutely. You can see, the, see the results of our work. So let's say, I don't want to be here for nothing. I want to be here so people can say, hey, I, I did some good things for them. Mm. Bruce, how do they get a hold of you? You want to drop your contact <clears throat> info? It'll all be below the show if you guys are listening in and or watching. Uh, my website's brucecardenas.com and then on Instagram, Bruce E. Cardenas. A lot of people seem to communicate via, via Instagram now. Hit them up in the DMs. Check out his different products, brands. Yeah. If you guys need coaching, consulting, Bruce is a man. I appreciate you hopping on the show. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Bruce. Yep. Peace.